This morning, I will be preaching on Psalm 46. But before I read the psalm, I thought it might actually be good to look at the structure of the psalm, just so we have that in mind as we go to it. We should consider its context. The book of Psalms, what we call the book of Psalms, is organized actually into five books. If you look before Psalm 1, you'll see it says book 1 as a header. If you go to Psalm 42, you'll see that there is actually a header that says book 2, and this continues throughout the book of Psalms until the book is organized into five books. Our psalm today lies at the very beginning of book 2 and highlights some major themes that run throughout this second book of the psalms, but also the psalms as a whole. Book 2 focuses on God's sovereignty, the difficulties of God's people, and that God's name will ultimately be proclaimed throughout the whole world. Psalm 46 is one of three psalms, along with Psalms 47 and 48, that are focused on a single theme, that God protects his people, that he protects his holy city, Jerusalem, and that God is the sovereign king over that city. These psalms can actually help us, they can serve as a grid for us as we read this second book of the psalms, and they can direct our attention to these themes that come up over and over again. When we, re when we read the laments of God's people throughout the second book of the Psalms, it helps us to realize that the Psalm is pointing us towards our total reliance on our Creator. Many speculate that the Psalm was written after the city of Jerusalem was protected from invasion. And some think that it actually points to the story of when Jerusalem was saved from Sennacherib the Assyrian and God miraculously saved Jerusalem. But although we can't be sure about the situation surrounding the psalm, we can be sure of the great truths found in it and that they apply to us today. With that introduction to the scripture, would you please stand for the reading of God's word as I read Psalm 46 for us. And as we turn there, it's good to remind ourselves that these are the words of the living and the true God. The psalmist writes, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can come with these words that you've given to us. We thank you that you are our fortress and our refuge, and we thank you that this is all through, all true through the work of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. This psalm is familiar to many of us, but if it's not to you, it has been instrumental in the lives of the saints throughout church history. Martin Luther, the great German reformer, especially clung to this psalm as evidenced by his writing of the great hymn of the faith, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. While we think of this as a great anthem of the Protestant Reformation, when Luther wrote the hymn, he was going through almost unimaginable pain and fear and pressure. And he was surrounded by death and fear. We don't know exactly when he wrote the psalm. It was published, or the hymn, it was published in 1529, but our best guess is that he wrote it in 1527 or the beginning of 1528. This is significant. It's a full decade after he nailed his 95 theses to the church, church door at Wittenberg. It's also important because this was the worst year of Martin Luther's life. For much of the year, the reformer was battling health problems. He was experiencing heart problems so severe that while he was preaching, he was fainting. He also had intestinal problems that he told his congregation he believed he was going to die. In the midst of this, the plague broke out in Wittenberg. And Luther and his wife, Katie, did not flee the city as many others did. Rather, they opened their home as a hospital for the sick and dying. 
Many of his own congregation, his friends, died in his living room. Katie was also expecting their second child, a daughter named Elizabeth, who would not live six months, probably because her mother was exposed to the plague. In the middle of all of this, Luther's only other living child at the time, Hans, grew desperately ill, and Luther believed he would die as well. Although he would survive, this brought much fear into the life of Martin Luther. This is the world that Luther was living in when he wrote A Mighty Fortress. For Luther, this was a hymn of comfort among, amid almost unimaginable sorrow and fear. He said about the psalm, We sing this psalm to the praise of God, because God is with us, and powerfully and miraculously preserves and defends his church in his words, against the gates of hell, against the implacable hatred of the devil, and against all the assaults of the world, the flesh, and sin. In more, or in less uh, formal settings, Luther often said to his friend and confidant, Philip Melanchthon, come, let us sing the 46th Psalm and let the devil do his worst. That's how much comfort it brought to him. Perhaps this morning you feel like Luther did in 1527. Perhaps you feel as though your world is crumbling, as though the people and the things that have brought you stability have crumbled and have failed you. If you aren't facing circumstances like that today, praise the Lord, but you certainly will at some point in your life. When that happens, where will you turn? To whom will you turn? Martin Luther might, might have asked you, who will be your fortress and your strength? Let's turn and look at the psalm that brought the great reformer so much comfort in a very similar situation. Let's look at the beginning of the psalm. The psalm opens with a few amazing verses. Let me read verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. In the first few verses, the psalmist paints a cataclysmic picture. The earth is giving way. Mountains are falling into the sea. The sea is surging up around us. This is symbolic language. It's called decreation language. And the point of this is to show us that the things around us can be shaken. The mountains, the pillars of the earth, as they're called in the Old Testament, their being shaken is to show us that anything in creation can be shaken. John Calvin noted that this is meant to denote the turning upside down of the whole world. Even with the collapse of the world, if the world were literally falling down around you, the psalmist says, that we have a foundational truth to cling to, that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And this is why Luther was so drawn to this psalm. Even with the worst trials of his life going on around him, the reformer knew that the God who created him and who upheld creation itself was his refuge and his strength. The for this forces us to examine ourselves. What do we rely on when things go wrong around us? Do we rely on what the world has to offer? Do we rely on our wealth? Do we rely on our own strength? As Americans, this can be easy to do. But the stark reality is that the world and everything that it has to offer will eventually fail us. Jesus told us that wealth cannot bring us security. We live in a prosperous nation, and we have for a long time. But that ultimately is not ultimate security. Jesus said, that these things are temporary and fleeting. He said that moths and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. In the same way, our faith in human institutions is misplaced. As we'll see later in this psalm, nations fall, human power collapses, Babylon fell, Egypt fell, Rome fell, and if the Lord tarries long enough, the United States will fall. This is why we don't place our trust in flags and nations. As David wrote in Psalm 20, some trust in chariots and others in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We often need to be asked the same question that Jesus turned and asked his disciples in the boat. Where is your faith? Psalm 46 tells us that only our triune God is worthy of our faith and our trust. Verses 4 through 7 of the psalm take a turn. They call us to consider God's provision for his people. Let's read Psalm uh, uh, verses 4 through 7 together. The psalmist writes, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, 
the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We see a huge shift here in the psalm. Verses 1 through 3, we're given a cataclysmic picture of things collapsing. But here in verse 4, we're introduced to a tranquil scene of a river. What is the psalmist trying to tell us by using this? The picture of a river is really important. Up until very recently, cities were built on bodies of water. This is for obvious reasons. Uh, Some were built on coastlines to make shipping easier, like the biblical cities of Ephesus and Corinth. But others, inland cities, were often built on rivers, which brought river, uh, water to the city. And this was especially true in the Middle East, where there was very little rainfall. If we look for examples of this, we can see that Babylon was built on the Euphrates, Nineveh was built on the Tigris, and Rome was built on the Tiber. What is interesting is that Jerusalem, the city of God mentioned here in the psalm, does not have a river which runs through it. This means the psalm cannot be referring to a physical river running through Jerusalem. And it probably means that it is not referring only to the physical city of Jerusalem. To unpack this image of a river flowing into the world or into the city of God, we actually have to look at all of Scripture. Rivers are heavily used in scriptural imagery, especially in the Old Testament and in prophecy. If we look at Genesis 2, we're told a river flew out of, or flowed out of Eden into the whole world. And later, we actually see in the prophet Ezekiel that he uses this river, this image of a river, in his prophecy. In Ezekiel 47, the prophet Ezekiel describes a river as he sees a river. It's a little trickle of water as he stands in the new temple. He's shown the new temple. He's shown the throne room of God. And from the foundation of the temple, a trickle of water runs out. And he says that as it gets farther and farther from the temple, it gets deeper and deeper. He says first he wades in it, then he swims in it. And eventually it gets so deep that he can no longer cross it. This is clearly meant to be symbolic language. The river does things we don't see actual rivers doing. It goes over mountain peaks, down through valleys, and back over other mountains. And commentators tell us that the path described by Ezekiel eventually flows into the Dead Sea. As I'm sure you know, the Dead Sea contains some of the saltiest water on earth, nine times saltier than the ocean. And it makes life impossible within its depths. It's a completely dead sea. In Ezekiel's vision, though, the water, when it runs into the Dead Sea, instead of the fresh water being corrupted by the salt water, the exact opposite happens. As soon as this river hits the Dead Sea, all of the water in the Dead Sea turns fresh. Fish immediately begin jumping out of it. Plants begin growing on its shores. Life bursts out from what, what was once dead. It's very reminiscent of Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2 statement that we were dead in our trespasses and sins until we're made alive by God in Christ. The picture is that from the throne of God flows a river that brings life to what was once dead. Charles Spurgeon said, every man's natural heart is a dead sea until it's renewed by grace. This river is a picture of God's grace flowing from his throne freely to his people. What was once dead is made alive by God. This river is a picture of the gospel, washing over the people of God, creating new life in them. And in fact, this image of a river flows through all of Scripture. And while the Bible ends, or begins, with a river flowing out of Eden, and right in the middle of the Bible, in Ezekiel, we see this river coming from the throne of God, Scripture actually ends with a river as well, and I believe that it's the same river running all through Scripture. If you'll turn with me to the very end of the Bible, to Revelation 22, I think that we'll see that this is a well-founded conclusion. In In Revelation 22, we actually see Eden being restored by God. I'm going to start reading in in verse 1 and read through verse 5. John wrote, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, 
bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. If you look down to verse 17 in Revelation 22, we are invited to drink the water of life that comes to us without price. This river of grace comes to us from the very throne of God. This river represents God's infinite grace to his people. We're washed in it. We're cleansed in it. And we're told to drink its water. Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well that he will give us living water that will never leave us thirsty. And that this water becomes in us, in, in us a spring of water welling up to eternal life. As I was thinking about this image of a river and God's people depending on it, it occurred to me that these people living in these cities in the Middle East didn't depend on this river only once. They didn't go to it once and get all the water they would ever need. No, they, they depended on it every day. They went to that river every day. This river of God's grace is the same with us. The gospel isn't just for the unconverted. Grace isn't just for unrepentant sinners. It's for the saints as well. We need the gospel every day. We need to hear it every day. We need to preach it to ourselves every day. We never outgrow the gospel. Our dependence on the grace of God never ends. And we ought to thank him that his grace is inexhaustible. We are saved by grace alone. And it's the grace of God alone that sustains us from the beginning of our regeneration until we're brought home to glory. Who is this river for? It's for all who come in faith. It's for all who repent and believe the gospel. Because we know our own hearts and because we know our own sin better than anyone else, sometimes I'm prone to forget that the gospel is for me too. Jesus went to the cross knowing my sin. In fact, he went to the cross because of my sin. If you have not, come, drink the water of life. Through faith, Christ lived, kept the law, was crucified, and was raised again so that those who put their faith in him might have eternal life. If you have not come to faith in Christ, repent and believe the gospel. Back in verse 4 of Psalm 46, we read that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. If the river that we see here is not a physical river, what do we do with this image of Jerusalem, of the city of God? I think we can safely say that this is a reference to the church. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews 2, or Hebrews 12, I'm sorry, we can see that this is a pretty clear connection. The book of Hebrews, just for context, was written to a group of Christians who were Jewish, they were Hebrews, who were thinking because of persecution to turn away from the church and back to Judaism. They were thinking of turning away from the new covenant of Christ and his blood back to the old covenant with its symbols and its shadows, with its sacrifices. In Hebrews 12, the author of the Hebrews is describing the kingdom that believers inhabit. And he says in verses 18 through 21 of Hebrews 12 that they're not coming to the Old Covenant. They're not coming to the mountain where God was on top. If you think back to Exodus, the people are at the bottom of Mount Sinai and they're making the golden calf. And Moses comes down the mountain and he sees the golden calf and he's terrified that God is going to wipe out the people of Israel because of their sin. The author of the Hebrews says, you didn't come to that mountain. Let's read what he, what he writes, starting in verse 22 of Hebrews 12. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We're told here that we as believers have come to the city of the living God. We've come to the church 
The NIV actually is one of the few translations that I think perfectly translates this. The ESV says that we've come to the assembly. The, I think the King James says the same thing. The word used here is ecclesia. It's the word that's used all through Matthew as the word church. We've come to the church, the city of the living God. It's expressly called that here. Back in verse 5 of Psalm 46, we're told that God is in the midst of his city. He's in the midst of his church, and his grace flows from his throne to his church like a river. This is why in verse 6, the psalmist writes that the city won't be moved. It's supported by God. It's upheld by God. Jesus said, I will build my church. I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Even with this amazing assurance in mind, we live in the real world, and we see what goes on around us, and sometimes it doesn't seem like God is completely in control to our feeble minds. Let's look at Psalm, back in Psalm 46 at verses 6 and 7. The psalmist writes, Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A few months ago, I preached a sermon at the church that we go to in North Carolina on Psalm 2. And Psalm 2 opens up the exact same way. It actually poses the same question. Psalm 2 says, opens with, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? Another word that you could use there is, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? In Psalm 46, we see, see the same thing. The nations conspire. The nations rage. The idea is that the peoples of the world are in full-blown rebellion against God. In Psalm 46, we have the exact same language, but we also have the same answer. Yes, the nations rage, but Christ has been installed as the king, and we are to submit to him. Our great comfort in this rebellion that we live in is that Christ is king, and he rules from his city, from his church. The same God who gives his people a river of grace that will flood the world also will destroy all resistance to his rule. Because of this, in verse 7, we're given this amazing statement, the Lord Almighty is with us. Yahweh Sabaoth is with us. Pastor likes to tell us, John Calvin translated that the God of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And this leads us to the last section of this psalm, verses 8 through 11 that call us to consider God's peace for his people. Let's read this last stanza where we'll see a lot of application for ourselves. The psalmist writes, starting in verse 8, Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We're told to come behold the works of the Lord. Come see what the Lord has done. So what's the immediate context for this in the psalm? In the immediate context, we're told to see the aftermath of this rebellion. How does it end for those who rage and conspire against God? We see their weapons laying broken on the ground. The bow is broken. The shield is spat is actually burned with fire. All resistance to God's rule will cease. And Isaiah 2 uses this exact image to show us how this will be accomplished. If you'll turn with me to Isaiah 2, at the very beginning of Isaiah, I'll start in verse 2. We see the aftermath of what happens. Isaiah 2, verse 2. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations, and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What ends this resistance? What ultimately brings peace? It's the spread of the gospel that goes out from Zion, 
The gospel goes out from the city of the living God. It goes out from the church. God is using the church, and he will continue to use the church to proclaim the gospel and to bring the nations to himself. And although the immediate context of the psalm points to this final rebellion and God's victory over his enemies, there are also great points of application for our own lives as well. Earlier, when I was speaking about the river that flows to the church in verse 4, I made the statement that we need the gospel every day. We need to daily look at the cross and see what Christ has done for us. The call to see the works of the Lord is a call to remember what Christ did for us on the cross. And one of the ways the Lord shows us this is through the sacraments. That's why he's given them to us. The sacraments give us something to look at and say, yes, I remember what the Lord did for me. I remember that I've been washed in his blood. I remember that his his body was broken for me. St. Augustine said that the sacraments are visible signs of invisible grace. Isn't that a great statement? Visible signs of invisible grace. They give us something to cling to, to see, because the Lord knows we're weak, and he knows that we need these things. When we take the bread and the wine at the Lord's Supper, we can hold it in our hands, we can taste it and say, yes, the body of Christ was broken for me. The blood of Christ was spilled for me. Our baptism should function in the same way. There's a story in 1 Samuel. After the Lord miraculously defeats the Philistines and protects his people, Samuel Samuel takes a stone, and he names it Ebenezer, the stone of help, and he sets it up for the people to see. So they can look by it and look at it as as they walk past it and say, I remember that the Lord helped us. Our baptism is is our own personal Ebenezer. I can look back to it and say, no, I've been washed by the blood of Christ. He's washed me from my sins. Regardless of whether you were baptized as an infant or as a 17-year-old like I was, or even in your later life, our baptism is something that we continuously look back to and say, I remember what Christ did for me. Our Belgic Confession sums this idea up wonderfully when it says baptism is profitable not only when the water is on us and when we receive it, but throughout our entire lives. Our hope for the future is built on what we've seen in the past and what we know has happened in the past. This story is a little uh, difficult to tell, but I will. When I was a kid, Mariano Rivera was the closer for the New York Yankees. For those of you who don't follow our national pastime, Mariano Rivera was the greatest relief pitcher to ever play the game, bar none. I remember sitting on my dad's couch in November of 2001. The Yankees were going into the bottom of the ninth in Game 7 of the World Series against the Arizona Diamondbacks, and 11-year-old Nick Costanzo was sure this thing was over. Mariano Rivera was on the mound. It was, a, it was a done deal. But the unimaginable happened, and Mariano Rivera blew that save, and the Yankees lost a World Series that still keeps me up at night. I was sure that the Yankees were going to win because I had seen Mariano Rivera close out so many games in the past. But unfortunately, Mariano Rivera, as I discovered that night, is human, and humans fail. They fail us, and we fail our God. But thankfully, we serve a God who controls all things. He declares the end from the beginning. He numbers our days. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. And he loved his people enough to send his son to die for them. We need to remember that through the person and work of Christ, God has done a great work for us. Our confidence that God is with us and that he will be our mighty fortress is rooted in the fact that he gave his son for us. We need to remember the big picture of God's redemptive plan. The same God who created the universe created you. The same God who brought his people out of slavery in Egypt brought us out of slavery to sin and death. The same God who brought Jesus back from the dead brought us from spiritual death to spiritual life. If the psalmist could say, A thousand years before Christ, come and see what the Lord has done. How much more can we, that we know Christ, we know his crucifixion, we know his resurrection, we have his words. And this is why this call to come behold the works of the Lord is also how we should evangelize. 
It's a call to tell the world, come see what Christ has done. Come see his sinless life. See his resurrection. See his death. See what he's done for his people and for his church. Come, hear his call to believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Our God will triumph. We're assured of that. His opponents will be defeated and his gospel will spread. And it is spreading to every tribe and people and tongue. This will happen through the advance of the church. Jesus told us, go into all the world making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is how the Lord works through his church. Isaiah says that the words of the Lord will go out and the people will come back in faith. And because of this, we have that wonderful statement in verse 10 of Psalm 46, to be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. Another way to translate that be still is to cease striving. Those who are rebelling against God are told to cease striving, stop rebelling. But his people are told to be still, to cease striving, and to trust in his sovereign rule. Habakkuk, the prophet, wrote that eventually the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Over the past couple months, some of you might know that Jessica and I have had a few trials. Uh, Just after Christmas, we were very concerned about our two-year-old daughter Mariana's hearing. She already has some hearing loss, and it got dramatically worse, but thankfully it was treatable. And then when we welcomed our youngest, Gabriella, back in April, things did not go according to plan. It It was quite a trial. And there are two sinful responses we can have to trials like this. One is what I'm prone to do. I like to minimize the trial. Ah, it's not that big of a deal. Or I can deal with it on my own. I can just muscle down. However, there are true trials in our lives. And we don't acknowledge them. It stops us from relying on the one who promises to be our refuge. We can't bear these things alone, and the Lord tells us not to. The other response is to despair. And this desperation also stops us from looking to the God who brings us all comfort. Jesus told us to come to him when we are burdened and heavy laden, and he will give us rest. Luther included this idea in A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which we'll sing in just a couple minutes. Verse 3 of the hymn reads as follows. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name, the Lord Almighty is his name. From age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Trials in our lives teach us to rely on the one who promises to be our fortress. For us personally, this, these last couple of months have really taught me to rely on the Lord. And he does this often through his church. We've had three separate churches, including the Pocono Reformed Bible Church, care for us greatly. And it's taught me to rely on him much more than I did before. In these last few months, it's been an exercise in trusting the providence of God. We read from Lord's Day 10 of the Heidelberg Catechism earlier about providence, and we're told to rely on the Lord through rain and drought, through fruitful and lean years, through sickness and health. And we're told that it's because all things come to us, not by chance, but from the hand of the one who promises to be our refuge in our strength. The psalm ends in verse 11 with a repetition of verse 7. Let me read it for us. Verse 11 reads, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty is with us. Jesus himself promised that he would be with us to the very end of the age. And at his birth, we were told that he is our Emmanuel, our God with us. This is the central message of the gospel. The Lord Almighty is with us. He gives us grace. It flows like a river from the throne of the Father through the work of the Son and is applied to us by the Holy Spirit. He gives us new life. He washes away our sins. And He gives us His peace. Because of this, we can rest in His sovereignty and we can be assured that we can take refuge in Him. He is our mighty fortress and He will be exalted into the ends of the earth. Amen. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this assurance.
We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you sent your son to die for us. We thank you that through his perfect life, death, and resurrection, we can have peace and that we can be assured that the Lord Almighty is with us and that the God of Jacob is our fortress. And it's in his name, Christ's name, that we pray. Amen.